Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Tyler McMullen. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Fastly, uh, which I imagine most of you have heard of at this point. Um, hopefully, seems likely. I don't know. Uh, if not, okay, we have a very large global network of servers, uh, heavily connected into most of the world's major ISPs, um, and we make that entire network available to you. Right? You can just program a many thousand server network spanning the entire globe using WebAssembly. Um, we build things on top of the network to solve specific problems, also in WASM. But the, for the people in this audience, it's just a massive WASM programmable distributed system with all the little like, primitives you need to get started. Right? That's how I describe what we do these days. Um, but that's not how we always talked about ourselves. You know, uh, we started out as just like kind of a much more flexible content delivery network sort of thing. Um, and that's still how a lot of people think about us. Um, don't worry, this is not a talk to sell you fastly, uh, but I am going to use it as an example of some things. So, um, so this is like our network map. It's actually outdated, but whatever. Um, the idea is that, you know, let's say there is a developer somewhere over there. Uh, they, write some, they write some code like that, you know. Uh, on their own computer, we have tooling, all the open source tooling that many of the people in this room have worked on, um, to convert that code into WebAssembly. That WebAssembly gets shipped off to a compilation cluster that we run, um, where we ahead of time compile it into actual like native machine code, right? That machine code then gets like spit out across the entire network, across the entire globe, um, and then a user comes along. User up here, you know, way up above where anyone lives, that's fine. Uh, they come along and they say, hey, I really want to go to polarbears.com. Sure. Uh, we go, okay, we know that polarbears.com refers to this particular module or components going into the future. Um, and we will instantiate that module. And then ultimately, it just turns into a like typical serverless sort of pattern, right? Where you get a request that comes in, and you can send a response out. You can do a bunch of other things inside of there, but yeah. Um, this talk, again, is not about Fastly, other than that I'll use our journey as a way of talking about WebAssembly as a whole. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you our services or anything like that. I don't think you are really the right audience for that. Um, <laughs> If I'm wrong about that, feel free to talk to me afterward, whatever. Um, what I am trying to sell you, however, is a vision for the future, a vision of both where we have come from and where we are going to. All right, so let's, to get to that vision with all the context that we need, let's go way back in time, like way back into like the early days, let's say like, uh, like 2016, like long time ago, right? Um, our network was growing at the time. Uh, we had problems, though. Like, you know, uh, we were growing, we were shipping a ton of new features, and our users wanted to do more and more complex and interesting things on our platform, which is, like, a great problem to have, right? Um, but the way that we typically, back then, uh, and even before that, like, the way that we typically expose new functionality to users was via a DSL, right, a domain-specific language. Um, that DSL was made specifically to be good at the kinds of things you typically want to do when you're a giant distributed HTTP proxy, aka a CDN, right? But noteworthily, that DSL also needed to produce code that could run really, really fast, like hundreds of gigabits per second per server fast, like hundreds of thousands of HTTP requests per second per server fast, like really fast, right? Um, and so, you know, the way that this DSL was designed, which is, you know, for the compiler engineers in the audience, this is going to, like, make your heads explode. Um, you know, we would take that DSL, we would compile that DSL into a bunch of completely unreadable, unmaintainable C code. You know, like a normal thing to do. 
Uh, and then you would take that C code and compile it into even more unreadable x64 binary, right? So we would have this shared object that we would produce, and then you would ship it out all over the world. You would link it into a running server, and then you would just jump into it, which like is terrifying, right? And so, you know, look, now if you want me to make a DSL that is safe, I can do that. If you want me to make a DSL that is fast, I can do that. But making one that is both safe and fast, while also being like extensible and maintainable and everything else that you actually want in real production software, that's really hard. Um, and it was getting harder, right? The more complexity we added to the DSL, the harder it was for us to think through all of the possible edge cases, think through all the possible interactions between all of the different features, and figure out what could possibly go wrong, right? So we couldn't give up either efficiency or safety, and so it meant that making changes was getting like exponentially more difficult. Like shipping a single feature, we would have to like test the living hell out of it. Like it would have to be like so thoroughly tested because it was terrifying, right? For like good reasons, right? So back in 2016, uh, you know, with all that weighing on us, like I slash we set out to figure out if there was a better way to do it. Yeah, that's a Lord of the Rings cap. And like just kind of felt that way going into it. We're like, all right, we're entering Mordor. This is terrifying. Um, so, we tried different ways of sandboxing our code. And the problem is that like, for the type of use case we were talking about, and I think is actually what a lot of you were talking about, um, there are kind of major flaws in all of them, right? So, right, let's, let's start at the top, right? So if you start with like system virtual machines, obviously like that's not gonna work for this type of use case. You know, thousands of customers, all over the world, like, you know, trying to spin up and down system level virtual machines isn't gonna work. So, but a lot of people at that time, like, we're talking about containers, and containers are like, oh man, this is like the new hotness. This is what everybody has to use. Like, this is the obvious answer to your question. But the problem is that it was still way too high level in order to, like, accomplish the kinds of goals that we had, right? Um, and I think one of the main reasons for that is that when you look at, like, system level virtual machines or containers, the way that they work is that they are assuming no knowledge of what is happening inside of them, right? You just have some code that is linked and running and doing whatever it needs to do, and like it's at the system virtual machine or container level, you're assuming that you can't see into that at all, right? Like you just have to accept whatever that is, and that's what it is, right? Okay, so like that's not gonna work for us, fine. Uh, what about like language level virtual machines? This is the way that well, honestly, like most serverless platforms until, you know, very recently with the people in this room, like this is typically the way that these service platforms were kind of built, right? So I argue that this is still too high level. Um, you know, you have to modify the language frequently to maintain safety. Um, you have to embed it inside of V8 or whatever else you want to do here. And the, the issue is ultimately, again, that like, it's just kind of too high level for the problem. So okay, so I looked at those and I was like, no, this is not right, I don't, I don't like this. Um, too much overhead. So what about, what if we go really low level? What if we go down to like the ISA level? What if we like, what if we approach this from like a native client sort of perspective? Which are like people in the room familiar with native client? All right, a few of you, right. So Native Client was a project out of Google back in the day, um, and the idea was that it was a way to, inside of Chrome, take an existing binary program that you had and like sandbox it. And the way that they did this is that they took the actual machine code, the, like x64, whatever other kind of machine code, and they would uh, modify it effectively, and uh, essentially they would modify it to make sure that it couldn't break out of a sandbox. Like, and if that seems hard, you are correct. That is a really hard thing to do. And in order to do that, even in a relatively efficient way, you have to like, make a lot of assumptions about the code, and you have to like, put a lot of guardrails around it. Right? I, I'll just breeze over like, the weird complexities of like, control flow and all of that. But like, so we looked at this and we're like, all right, this isn't great for us either, uh, and in fact, it turns out that the entire native client team at Google had also just moved over to WebAssembly at the time, which I found out later. <laughs> but like, hey, there's this new thing. It kind of seems like it's at the exact level that we need it to be, which is like above the ISA, but like basically as low level as you can get before that. 
that thing, of course, was WebAssembly. <clears throat> the issue, of course, is that it was like, it was really early days, though, right? And the only high quality implementations at that point were actually in browsers, right? In Mozilla and Firefox and so on. Um, I don't know why that disappeared. That's cool. Um, the only thing that existed that I know of, that I found at the time, was a, uh, was a, a project called Wavum. I have a ton of respect for Wavum. However, uh, we didn't love a new compiler written in C++ that we were going to run on thousands of servers simultaneously, and that was terrifying to me. So we're like, ah, maybe we don't do that. Maybe we do something else. So we found this little project that was at the time called Craton. It was a very early project from a couple of Mozilla engineers. Um, and that project would soon be renamed to CraneLift. Um, and again, this is back in 2016. So we, we set about like, helping these couple engineers at Mozilla develop what was to become CraneLift at the time. Um, and simultaneously, inside our own company, we were developing something on top of it called Lucid, which is an ahead of time compiler using CraneLift. <clears throat> Little did I know at the time, actually, I, I think I did know about it at the time. Um, Dan Goman, who is here and speaking later today, started developing a JIT compiler on top of CraneLift called. All right, I guess that's just not going to appear. It's supposed to come down and say, Wasm time. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So at that point, a bunch of things happened, hand wave, hand wave. Many of these Mozilla engineers came over to like, work with us at Fastly. We combined forces. And we implemented all the important features of Lucid in Wasm time, and we killed off, Wasm, or, uh, killed off Lucid. So both of those compilers are now one. They're called Wasm time, and that's what we work on. So OK. That brings us to approximately 2018. All right. So now, with that kind of context, now might be a good time for me to step back and explain what I mean when I say, write once, run anywhere. When you think about it for like a couple seconds with like an open mind, uh, that actually isn't that high of a bar, honestly, right? Uh, JavaScript runs in a lot of places. Is JavaScript write once, run anywhere? I don't know, maybe. Uh, you know what else runs in a lot of places? C. C is highly portable. Like, really highly portable. I can run C on a massive server or on, like, the tiniest embedded device. Is that right once run anywhere? Well, sure. If your standards for safety, performance, and language operability are low enough, you can adapt anything to run anywhere. And, you know, nothing stops you from, say, writing a COBOL interpreter in Ruby, um, and there you go. Like, now you can run COBOL programs inside your Ruby script. Like, that's exactly what you wanted, right? Um, so I guess I should probably be a little bit more precise about what I mean with this, right? So when I talk about write once, run anywhere, what I'm talking about is the ability to write a program, compile it, and run it in a huge variety of locations without having to worry about things like the security model, um, and without dramatically sacrificing the performance of whatever platform it is being run on. Likewise, I also mean you shouldn't have to do mountains of work to adapt every new language to those platforms. In typical serverless platforms, huge amounts of security work uh, must be done for every new language, right? Even new versions of languages that are already on those platforms typically take, you know, potentially years to actually adapt and like make production like worthy, which is why those languages tend to be like potentially years out of date. Um, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but you know, feel free to go look at some of the popular serverless platforms, and you'll see like, oh wow, this is like you know several years out of date. Even where anyway, whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> So when I say write once, run anywhere, what I mean is write once and run safely in everything from browsers to servers, ARM to Intel, and embedded devices to supercomputers, right? <clears throat> I also mean being able to run multiple languages at the same time, which might seem slightly surprising. Um, so when we think about write once, run anywhere, it's often a joke where people like point and laugh at Java, right? That's usually how people use the term write once, run anywhere. They're like, ha, 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 yeah, remember that? What Java got wrong, I argue, is primarily the security model. Because it didn't have sandboxing built in at a fundamental level, um, 
it was a source of constant vulnerabilities. And also, not only vulnerabilities, but also a source of constant changes and disparity between different places to run Java because it didn't have that fundamental security model built into it. There are tons of places where it never fit at all just because it was just that unsafe. So like Java never got, or in the cases where it did get it initially, like browsers or mobile development, it just couldn't maintain like the massive cross-platform adoption that it initially dreamed of, right? Until WebAssembly, though, the JVM was kind of the closest thing that we have ever really had to a real language agnostic bytecode, even if that was arguably completely an accident. <laughs> but like, you know, that said, like, I'll say that back in the day, I did a lot of JVM-related programming. It wasn't my main thing, but I did, like, I did Java, I did JRuby, I did Scala, I did Clojure, you name it. Like, I've done all those things. And let me tell you how magical it felt to be able to write a program in Ruby, which then pulls in a Java library that I already know and, like, know is high quality. I can just pull it in and run it. And then I take my little JRuby program and I call it as a library in my Scala program. Like, it was a really magical experience when it worked. Um, <laughs> my point is that I have no idea what happened to my slides. That's exciting. Uh, that's cool. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get them back eventually. My point is that write once, run anywhere applies not just to which processor and operating system you're in, but also in the ability to say, write one solid library, which then gets used from multiple other languages. Like, run anywhere can also mean inside of a different program, inside of a different language. It means being able to run on Intel and ARM and in the cloud and on a watch, yes, but it also means being able to run inside another language. Um, to me, it's really about compo like, compatibility and adaptability. And the reason that matters so much to me requires us to get back to our story. So we made it to 2018. So let's zip forward a bit just to the year 2019, right? We've reached the year of 2019, <clears throat> and I'd say like the beginning of the story probably sounded somewhat familiar to many of you who've ended up in the WebAssembly world. Um, if the next part doesn't sound familiar yet, I conjecture that it will as your systems grow. So we developed these compilers along with like many people in the community, and internally at Fastly, we were also developing a server made specifically to run WebAssembly programs like really, really fast on our specific hardware. So it was like, anyway, um, it runs lots of WebAssembly programs really, really fast. And it doesn't care at all about the language it's written in, except for one thing, except for one little part, right? And that, that part is the host ABI layer. All right. So I assume everyone in the audience is familiar with the data types that WebAssembly offers, which is to say it offers a couple numbers and nothing. Um, <clears throat> and of course it doesn't, right? It, it shouldn't, right? It needs to be low level enough to adapt to any processor and real human processors, human, real computer processors uh, don't have registers for things like strings and vectors and so on, right? They have floats and ints. That's what they got. So of course, neither does WebAssembly. But when you start trying to cross the guest to host boundary, you need a common language to speak, right? And so early attempts at that host guest boundary that a lot of us worked on back in, you know, pre-2020, um, it looked a lot like this. They looked a lot like, you know, essentially Linux syscalls, right? Um, I have a function which takes, or which, uh, which, you know, takes two integers and a pointer to an integer, and returns an integer, everything's an integer, right? Um, and so in this case, like, what is read bytes returning? Who knows? Two integers. There you go. That's all you get. Um, and so, like, you know, as we were working on this in the early days, again, like, I'm going to keep referring to Dan Goman because he and I have worked together on so many of these things. Uh, like, the initial version of WASI was based on something called Cloud ABI, right? Um, and essentially, like, the interfaces ended up looking a lot like this. And so something called interface types became a thing that we were working on. And so, wait, do, 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 all right, I do feel like I messed up a couple slides here, but that's okay, there's definitely supposed to be a thing after this. Sorry, give me one second here. Okay, so, 
we're just, I guess we're just going to skip over that part. That's fine. Okay, so <clears throat> we ended up in a situation that looked kind of like this, right? Where you have the guest code running at the bottom here, in whatever language you want to have it written in, you have like the host code up above, right? And the, the host code is red because it's essentially the trusted code base, right? It is the code that like isn't running inside of the WebAssembly sandbox. And that obviously, like the more code that is there, the more concern we have effectively. And so let's imagine we have a sockets API that exists there, but we really want to provide our users an HTTP level API. So we have a few different options, right? One of them is that we just stick it on the trusted code side. We just stick it over on the host side of things, and every different language will just talk to that, and that HTTP API, maybe it talks to the socket API, that's fine. But now, it's in, again, it's in that trusted code base, and that is concerning, right? The other option that we have is we say, OK, why don't we just move the HTTP API into the guest code? OK. What that does mean, however, is that for every language we want to support, we now need to write an HTTP API that talks to the Sockets API. And I don't know who here has worked on, worked on like an HTTP library before. HTTP is really complicated, like way more complicated than most people imagine it is. Uh, like, wait until you get into like the caching level stuff inside of like the actual RFCs. That it's 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 too much. It's way too much. Um, and so, we don't love that solution either, right? What we would really like to be able to do is to have a single HTTP API that we write inside of the guest and have all the different languages speak directly to that one HTTP API and have that go out to just communicate with the Sockets API on the other side. And so, with that in mind, that allowed us to go from, man, this really got confused. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with this. Um, so stepping back to interface types, the whole idea here is that it would allow us to go from that read bytes where it returns two completely unknown integers uh, and turn that into something that looked more like actually, let's read bytes, and we're going to return a list. And again, obviously, WebAssembly doesn't have a list type, but the, uh, the language is such that we can apply a layer on top of WebAssembly that knows how to lower or, uh, or, or raise a list type into like native actual like data types, right? And one of the cool things about this was that we only had to write this once, right? And most of you have used this thing. Um, it allows us to prove the safety of the binding between the guest and the host. Rather than blindly following pointers and going with the hopes and prayers approach to safety, we can write that binding layer once, we can test it, we can fuzz the living hell out of it, and perhaps even, you know, potentially, if one knows how to do it, make proofs about it, right? So, okay, so that's interface types. Um, that part has been made better. And so this was the part where I was up at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. trying to finish this. And so this is the one slide I didn't finish. So it says start of component model stuff here. So everyone bask in that. <laughs> um, so right, traditionally inside of WebAssembly you have a module, right? The whole idea with the component model and like I thought about like getting really detailed with the component model stuff here. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to like kind of breeze over this whole thing to get back to the like main storyline that I'm trying to talk about here. The whole idea though is that component is just like a wrapper around a module. It's a wrapper that if we think back to what we were just talking about where like <clears throat> where the binding layer with the host had a very low level interface that we wanted to raise into something that is higher level, what if we do the same thing with a module? Right. What if we take a module which only has imports and exports that like, have native level like data types, and we instead raise it to be able to convert it into, oh, now we have our export that re reads request and returns a string. Cool. So if we have this, the whole idea with the component model is really, in many ways, just to be able to say, like, all right, my, my JavaScript is in a component, my Rust is in a component, my JavaScript implements, imports a left pad function. <laughs> Glad there are people who remember that. <laughs> My Rust exports a left pad function, and hey, look, they have the same interface. Even though JavaScript and Rust have entirely different ways of representing those things. And we can bind those things together, do a little bit of transcoding, and actually like 
from my JavaScript program called a Rust program, right? Everybody in the audience knows this, I assume. And so that allows us to get back to that point where, um, where we can fix this problem entirely. Rather than writing more and more APIs on the host side, risking safety of the entire system, we can write APIs that are also entirely sandboxed um, and only expose the minimum system API. That was supposed to be like a big reveal and big happy thing there, but like, you know, slides are slides. So, right, I should note something here. There is a tremendous amount more to the component model, um, and the way that it interacts with WASI is, frankly, in my opinion, brilliant, and you'll hear a lot more about that from Dan later. Um, but as I was preparing this talk, uh, I was chatting with Luke, who I, like Luke Wagner, who I work with uh, quite frequently, and I asked Luke for some suggestions about things I should talk about about the component model. Um, and Luke sent me uh, several slide decks, and those slide decks looked like this. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> which, like, I love it, you know, uh, but perhaps 9 a.m. on the first day of a conference is not the right time to dive into that. <laughs> but I actually show this here to make a point, right? The work that is going on inside of, like, all of these additional proposals on top of WebAssembly is really hard and really serious work, right? So this is specifically about, like, structured concurrency and how we can, like, actually have shared concurrency between multiple different languages. As far as I know, that has never existed before. That's like really, really cool work. The folks who are working on core WebAssembly and the layers being built upon it, um, like the component model on WASI, are, are not half-assing this, right? Like we're trying to solve real hard problems and like it's great. So that brings us to 2023. We'll just breeze over 2020 because you know that was, that was a rough time for everyone. So what about the future? So what's that vision that I was mentioning earlier? Well, if you followed this and you're nodding your head going like, yeah, I've been using those tools. Yeah, I, I, I understand why those things are useful and why, why they were built and why we have, we have all been putting so much effort into this. Um, I, I argue that you actually already know what that vision is, right? And you're already on the path. We're all already on this path together. Like we as a community are designing the answer to the right once run anywhere problem which has never been sufficiently solved in the past, right? We've designed a low-level, ISA-agnostic, OS-agnostic, sandbox-safe core language. We've designed a way of creating safe and efficient interfaces on top of it for interacting with the outside world. We've designed a way to seamlessly work across languages in a way that has, like, literally never been done before. Like, that's huge. That's a huge amount of things that this, like, community has accomplished together. Um, you know, these are problems that have plagued programmers since, like, the beginning of programming. That's huge. So, look, there are many reasons why I think WebAssembly is, like, the answer to write once, run anywhere, and I, why I think it will actually stick. Uh, is it because it's a low-level bytecode that is designed to be efficient across multiple processors? Yeah, yeah. Is it because it was made with an unopinionated calling convention, which is low level enough that we can like, develop a higher level way on top of it of interacting in a cross-language manner? Yeah, of course. Is it because it's capable of having a higher level but still efficient layer added above it to describe components which can like, be used across multiple platforms and across multiple languages? Also, yeah. Right? But the ultimate reason which encompasses all of these is actually about the community around WebAssembly. We've all, I think everybody in this room has shown like a real willingness to like put in the hard and sometimes incredibly tedious work that is involved in solving these hard problems. Um, and the WASM community has also been widely accepting of new ideas and new approaches to problems that have emerged in order and like work together to make those things a success. So to me, that's actually the real strength and the real vision here. Nothing is ever free but WebAssembly will be the answer to the right once run anywhere problem because we as a community will make it so. That is the whole answer to this problem. And that's what I got. Thank you. <laughs>